So a very warm welcome to the Java user group um, online event we are doing these days. And today, actually, we will have Matt Rabel from Okta um, doing his full stack reactive uh, with React and Spring Web Flux talk for us, but actually in a different format. As you know, we have the coronavirus spreading, and the idea is actually not to spread it too much so that our healthcare system is actually not um, over flooded with people. So that's why we are now like trying this opportunity to actually use a new format and doing it online. So yeah, the new format actually was for us in the last few days, something where we tried to find a platform how we can do live streaming and actually it pushed us in a direction where we try to work with new tools and let's see what that means also for the future for us. So if we are continuing to doing this format or we like, like do a mixture of the current or the standard docs and beers and as well the online format as well. So um, we will have at the end of the talk um, a feedback form which should pop up automatically for you. So please answer the questions as usual during the Java user group talks. So that would be really awesome. Um, you will actually see that we will have some delay um, in the stream. So that means if you answer or if you um, write questions into the chat, we cannot immediately see that. Uh, we will see that a bit later because we are like 15 seconds ahead of you. Please use for um, questions, um, not the chat. The chat is meant like if you have technical problems, um, ask your questions there and Marcus from the Java user group will actually help you. So for questions which you have for Matt, please use the Q&A because that is like the area to do it because then we just have the questions filtered and that makes it very easy for us to monitor the question. So if the question is a good fit to the current talk of Matt, I will pick that up, jump in, and will ask him the questions directly. If there are like more general questions, we will wait until the end so Matt can answer the questions at the end. Yes. Matt will also will use a feature which is called Pulse. So you will see on your screen um, above, actually, the video, some pop-up coming up where you have to answer those questions. So press one of these options. It's not always yes or no. Sometimes it is, sometimes not. You might have also multiple options for answering, right? So we will make sure that you have enough time to answer those questions. And then also Matt will use that in his further presentation. So now I would love to hand over directly to Matt and I'm really happy to have him actually online because we just talked before and I was realizing that I saw him about, uh, about 20, no, not 20, but about 10 years ago. I met DevOps the first time. And since then, he's like a, a crazy guy traveling the world, talking especially about Che Hipster, Spring Boot, and also um, all this Okta stuff. So, Matt, the stage is yours. Thank you, Patrick. All right, so let me share my screen here. All right, welcome to Full Stack Reactive with React and Spring Web Flux. This whole presentation started from a collaboration that Josh Long and I did, so I like to give him some credit because this is his work as well, and so I throw the slide up there for him first and uh, you can contact him on Twitter, or there's his email as well. And what Josh did is he actually, we collaborated on a blog post, and it's a three-part series where he does an introduction to reactive programming, and then we talk about Spring Web Flux and how you build APIs with it, and then in the final series, we add React, and we do everything that I'm going to show you today. Well, we wrote so much information in those first couple articles that he decided to write a book on Reactive Spring. So if you go to reactivespringbook.io, um, there is a beta version of his book that you can download, and, uh, and a lot of what you'll see here today is in there. So my name is Matt Rabel. 
I like to uh, ski and mountain bike and whitewater raft. I was actually born in the backwoods of Montana in a log cabin on the left there. My parents had the bedroom on the right, and that was built by my great grandparents way back in uh, 1917. And so I grew up there, no electricity, no running water. I had to use an outhouse and all that for 16 years and walk two miles to the bus stop every day. So it felt like it was uphill both ways, but in the winter we got to ski. I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife, Trish, and my two awesome kids, Abby and Jack. This photo is a couple years old. Jack is actually taller and bigger than me now, so a lot happens when they uh, start to grow up and become teenagers. I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe for Hefeweizen, since he is a German vehicle. I bought him off eBay in 2004, and I spent the next 12 years restoring him. I didn't do it myself because I didn't have the tools, but I should have because now I'd have the tools. I went through seven different shops and uh, took quite some time. So if you followed me on my blog, I always thought it was going to be done in six months. And so I guess I'm good at hope. I work for a company called Okta. My dad calls it Okra, so feel free to mispronounce it. But Okta, the word actually is a unit of cloud measurement. It means that how many clouds are in the sky, if it's an eight Okta day, that's the maximum number. It means it's very overcast, very cloudy. If it's a zero Okta day, it means it's nice and sunny. So we do users as a software service. Uh, acronym for that's not great, you ask. <laughs> so I like to say user management as a software service. And if you sign up for a developer account at developer.octa.com, you get up to 1,000 monthly active users for free. And uh, if you want to up that, then, of course, you can pay for it. So now I have a bunch of polls that I'd like to ask to learn a bit more about you. And so I'm going to send these polls out, and then I'm going to I have a little timer here to wait 30 seconds because first of all, I know you're delayed. And also as soon as uh, I send one poll, it erases the, the previous one. So we'll send that one out first. Are you using Spring Boot? So I like to get a feel from the audience how many people are using Spring Boot. And I'll start that timer. About 15 seconds left here, and then I'll start the next one. The next one's going to be more about using Spring Webflux. So if you're a Spring Webflux user, because I know just because you're using Spring Boot doesn't necessarily mean you're using Spring Webflux. So send that one out. And then my next question is going to be, what's your preferred JVM language between Scala, Java, Groovy, and Kotlin? So from the first one, it looks like most people are using Spring Boot, 85% uh, are using Spring Webflux, 15% uh, are. And then what's your preferred JVM language? Java is winning. All right, now I'd like to ask a bit about web frameworks and preferences there. So what's your preferred web framework? So Angular, React, Views, Struts, and JSF. I threw Struts and JSF in there just for fun. But I realize, you know, people are still using them. And then finally, the one that, uh, that I like to ask Java developers in particular, do you prefer JavaScript and TypeScript? And this is because I used to speak at conferences and ask Java developers how many people you know, like JavaScript and hardly any hands would go up. And now it's gotten a lot better, but I find that a lot of people like TypeScript. So let's, let's see what the answers are here. So preferred JVM language, 90% Java, 10% Kotlin. Skull and Groovy didn't, Groovy didn't even register, which isn't that out of the ordinary. Prefer web framework is Angular, 61%. React is 24. We got some with Vue and a little bit of JSF. No struts, so that's probably good. And then do you prefer JavaScript or TypeScript? Looks like 80% like TypeScript. All right. 
So thank you for all your answers there. Now back to the presentation. So like I mentioned, this presentation is based on this series of blog posts that Josh and I wrote. And if you wanted to read those, there's a link at the bot bottom there, bit.ly, Webflux, and React. And so today we'll talk about what is reactive programming, first of all, and then we'll do an introduction to Spring Webflux, and I'll show you how to develop an API with Spring Webflux. And then what I really wanted, and the reason I started this whole idea and wrote this blog post and article with Josh, was I wanted to see how to handle streaming data with React. Because what I've heard from Spring Webflux is it's not great for like CRUD applications, but it's really good for streaming data. So that's great on the server side, but I like the client side. So how do you handle streaming data on the client and different techniques for that? So I'll show you a few different options there. And then I'll show you how to secure Webflux and React. So to begin, what is reactive programming? Well, it all starts with asynchronous I.O. So it's an approach to writing software that embraces asynchronous I.O. And it's a small idea that portends big changes for software. So it's, the idea is pretty simple. It's basically just alleviating inefficient resources by reclaiming resources that otherwise would be idle. So in a traditional you know, non-reactive application, the threads are used up while processing might not be happening. And with asynchronous IO, it just you know kicks off process and then it doesn't wait for any response. So let's look at an example that compares and contrasts asynchronous IO to synchronous IO. So this is a synchronous example. You can see here that uh, first of all, we source the file using a regular java.io file. And then we pull the results results out of the source, you know, one line at a time. That's the while loop there. And then it accepts a consumer bytes payload that gets called when there's new data. Versus in a synchronous version, so I'll let you look at the uh, the synchronous version again. All right, look at that one a bit. So it's it's much more concise, first of all. And notice that Lombok log for G, J2 annotation. That's That's pretty handy if you're using Lombok. So the asynchronous version, um, you have to use a Java NIO file instead of the Java IO file. And then you create a channel, right? That's where that file channel is, this dot file channel. And you specify an executor service. And that will be used to invoke our completion handler when there's data available. And then you start reading, passing in a reference to a completion handler. And in completed, we read the bytes out of the byte buffer into a byte holder, and the byte data is passed to the consumer. Right, so two slides worth of code instead of about 10 lines of code. So obviously the asynchronous version is very more verbose, but it also allows you to do a lot more handling of files and reading them and not use as many resources on your server. So how do you map your Java brain to synchronous or asynchronous IO and the pushback mechanism and flow control and all that in distributed systems? Well, in reactive programming, the ability of the client to signal how much work can be handled is called back pressure. And there's a good deal of projects that actually support this already. There's like Vertex, Aka Streams, and RX Java, and they all support reactive programming. And the Spring team has this project called Reactor. And so there's common enough ground across all these frameworks that these different approaches were extracted into a de facto standard called the Reactive Streams Initiative. And the Reactive Streams Initiative defines four types. So first of all, there's a publisher that's a producer of values that may eventually arrive, and a publisher produces values of type T to a subscriber. And then a subscriber subscribes to that publisher of type T, receiving notifications on any new value of type T through its on next method. If there's any errors, it calls on error. And when processing is complete, it calls it on complete. And then there's also a subscription. So when a subscriber first connects to a publisher, it is given a subscription in its subscriber on subscribe method. And then the subscription is arguably the most important part of everything because it enables the back pressure. The subscriber uses a subscription.request method to request more data or the cancel method to halt processing. And then there's also a processor 
that combines both the publisher and the subscriber. So a simple interface, but allows you to do more in one class. And so Spring Framework 5 was released in September 2017. So it's been, you know, two and a half years. It builds on Reactor, builds on the Reactive Stream specification, and includes a new Reactive runtime known as Spring Webflux. And one of the questions that I get from a lot of people is, when should I use Spring MVC versus when should I use Spring Webflux? And what I've seen and what I've heard is basically performance differences are negligible until you're doing a lot of API calls of the scale of at least 500 requests per second, give or take. So if you have that kind of traffic and that kind of load, then maybe look at using Spring Webflux. But a lot of the load testing and comparisons I've seen is if you're just doing CRUD applications, Spring MVC and Spring Webflux are pretty much similar. Um, but if you're doing a lot of streaming data and you have a lot more going on, then, uh, then Spring Webflux will probably work well for you. So we all know and love Spring Boot, especially since the Spring Boot API can be written in very few lines of code. This is just a simple example of a demo application. And we have an entity that's a blog, and we just have some annotations that define its you know, properties. The getters and setters I eliminated because then it wouldn't fit on one slide. Uh, but if you're using Java 14 records, maybe you could eliminate those. Or if you're using Lombok, you could just put all the annotations on one line, and then you could get rid of those getters and setters. But I have heard that Elonbach with uh, Hibernate entities and JPA isn't a great idea. So maybe do some more investigation on that first. Great for demos, but not the real world. And then at the bottom is another great for demo thing, the blog repository extending JPA repository and using the repository REST resource. What that annotation does is it takes blog and it puts it at a REST endpoint so you can put, post, get, and delete that entity. And so that's called an anemic domain model. That is not on ThoughtWorks radar as a recommended thing, um, but it's great for demos. Again, um, you know, this code right here, if you have those getters and setters in there, will compile, will run, and you have a REST API and, you know, about 20 lines of code. So now what I'd like to do is build a Spring Webflux API using start.spring.io, one of the happiest places on the internet. And the reason for that is because if you're at start.spring.io, you're starting a new project or you're doing a demo. You're not doing maintenance usually. So um, that's why I like it. So um, what I'm gonna do here is usually I do a spring demo and build the Webflex API. And then I go into actually building the React uh, component. And then I'll come back to the slides and go over some more React stuff. But I find it's, it's easier if we just do all the coding at once. So let me close these slides down here and then get my screen going. So um, here's the blog post here, full stack reactive with Spring Webflux, WebSockets and React. It's the third one in the series. And if you go to the very bottom, there's a link to a GitHub repo. And in this GitHub repo, I have a demo.adoc. There's also a workshop if you want to you know, go through the steps yourself. But this has a lot of shortcuts in it that I use for this demo in particular. It's written in ASCII doctor. I have an ASCII doctor plugin installed. That's why you see the nice formatting. So I can put that on the left. Also, I'm gonna use a number of shortcuts. Those are IntelliJ Live Templates. So just to show you those, if you go to my GitHub repo for IntelliJ Live Templates, you could import them all here. I just updated an hour ago the full stack reactive ones. And so anything that I do today using IntelliJ Live Templates, you could do as well. So I'm gonna start by creating a new Webflux application. You'll see I'm going to use an alias called Webflux Start. So if I look at that, you can see it hits start.spring.io, starter.zip endpoint, and that allows us to download a zip file. It uses data MongoDB Reactive, as well as Webflux, DevTools, and Lombok. So we'll go ahead and run that. That downloads a demo.zip file. So I'll create a, we'll call it reactive demo. And the take command is handy because it creates a directory and then puts you in there. And then we can unzip that demo.zip and we'll put it in a Webflux directory. Okay. And so now in the Webflux directory, I'll open that up in IntelliJ. Should I ask how many people use IntelliJ versus NetBeans versus Eclipse? But I, 
You know, the answer has changed a lot. It used to be like 50-50, half people using Eclipse, half the people using IntelliJ. And what I've seen in the last few months is uh, is like 75% of people are using IntelliJ. So hopefully Eclipse is still doing well. Um, not much NetBeans usage out there, but um, that's not too bad. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm first going to create an entity called Profile. And so this service is just going to serve up profiles. And at one point, we'll start streaming profiles. But I want to keep the data model really easy just to make things easier to understand. So we'll go into the source main Java directory in this demo here. And I'll create a profile. So I'll just do it right in this class. We'll start with my short code called Webflux Entity. and then call it profile. So it uses Lombok there. It's just got an ID and an email. And then we'll create a Webflux repo. This will be our profile reactive Mongo repository. That just extends and it'll give us all that CRUD functionality. And then we'll also create a new class. We'll call it a uh, sample data initializer. So I'm just gonna create it here first, so create new class, sample data initializer, you can see here that has a spring profile in it, so I only want to run this when I'm in demo mode, and we're just extending application listener here. We're pulling in that profile repository. And then when the application starts, delete all the existing records and then grab the reactor one. So just pull this in a little more so it's easier to read. So we're just, we're taking A, B, C, and D. We're creating email addresses for the profile and then we're saving them to the database and then we're going to print them out. So this is a very important point in reactive programming, the subscribe. If you don't actually subscribe to what's going on, nothing will actually happen. So it's very important to do that at the end and show that we're saving those in the database. So now we're good to go there. We can save that. And so I will actually run this now. So from the terminal, to activate that demo profile, you can do spring profiles active and specify demo, so this is just an environment variable pretty much, and then MVN. And if you're a Spring Boot developer, you've probably seen this before where, gosh darn it, no goals have been specified. So a quick tip that if you go down to the build section, you can add a default goal, and we'll call it Spring Boot Run. And we can run that, and it'll actually pull that in. And now it executes that as the default goal. And so we're just doing this to actually see the data being inserted into the database. And you'll see one of the things that happens in normal Spring Boot, if your database isn't up, like you can't connect, your application dies. But in this case, it's actually, you know, still waiting for the connection. So if I started MongoD right here, you can see that Spring Boot connects to it and actually you know, inserts that data, A, B, C, and D. Not in the same order, but we don't care about that. So that's all working. Now what I'd like to do is uh, we'll close this down and we'll go ahead and create a profile service. And this will make it because I'm going to create two different types of controllers. I'm gonna do what you're probably more familiar with, which is like a REST controller that looks like Spring MVC. And then I'm gonna create a profile handler that uses a lot of the newer syntax from Spring Webflux. So both will work, but I'm just gonna consolidate this logic in a profile service. So it uses a service annotation, it pulls in an application event publisher, the profile repository, and it goes ahead and uses Flux to get all for that repository, to do a get, to do an update, to do a delete, and then I'm just going to comment out this, do on success for now. Um, because eventually what we're going to want to do is when we create a new profile, we're going to want to publish that. And then the publishing of it, we can grab it with WebSockets or service and events and actually stream it to the client. 
So now I'll create a web a controller, right? Classic controller. So we'll call this profile rest controller. If we look at this one, it's using classic as its profile. So it'll only run when we're actually using the classic profile. And it just calls that service to return different things. So you'll notice instead of returning, you know, an object, we're returning publishers. And so that has the profile objects in it. And, uh, you know, there's just create, delete, update, all that kind of stuff. So now if we were to run that using classic, Then we'll have our REST endpoints and we can actually talk to it. So let's put that data in there. We'll create a new window here. Minimize that one. And we'll start by just getting using HTTP. Um, it's kind of like curl, but a little better. HTTPIE.org is where you can download it. So I can go to the profiles endpoint. And you'll see they're actually in there. So I wanted to use a classic one. Oh, I can still demo it without that. So classic, I guess demo deletes them all. And since I already ran the, the demo mode, um, they're in there already. So that's OK. So I can just show you how I can add a new one. So if I do post 8080 profiles and use email, my email, matt.rable, Doctor.com. You can use that if you have any questions about this presentation. And then I go back to profiles. You can see it's been out at the bottom there. I could put it and update it. Um, I could also delete it. So if I wanted to go to delete profiles and use that particular ID, I can do that. And if we clear it and we run it, it's gone, right? So we have a full working CRUD API. Now let's do a bit more with the events side of things. So I'm going to start by creating a profile created event. You can see it's very simple. It just extends application event. And I'll grab that profile and send it to anyone that's listening for it. And then I'll create a profile created event publisher. You'll see this implements application listener and a consumer. And this is, you know, how you do the, uh, the flux stuff within spring to actually send that out and accept that, you know, event. So on the application event here, it'll grab it and call that next. And then here's where it accepts it and uh, disposes of it. So now let's do the uh, profile service update. So remember, I commented this out. We can say do on success, actually publish that event now. And so we have that application event publisher that we're implementing right here for profile created event publisher. And now we'll need uh, WebSockets, so WebSocket configuration. It's a little bigger of a class, but you'll see it just has a handler mapping at WS Profiles. And then it uses a WebSocket handler adapter as a bean. And this WebSocket handler will basically grab that event publisher and listen for any messages that come through. And then once they come through, it'll publish it using Jackson to basically grab that object and write its value as a string. And then it sends it out as a text message here. And then finally the WebSocket sends it as well. So that's how that message flux is all composed. And now what we can do is create the Spring WebFlux version of our API endpoints. So We'll create a profile handler. You'll see what this does is similar to our Spring MVC controller. It just calls 
our profile service. But the default read response is the real meat of it, where it takes a server response, sends back a 200 error message, makes sure it's application JSON, and then whatever body is given to it right here, it streams that out. So this is how you would do, you know, more lower level coding with uh, with Spring Webflux. And now I'll create a profile endpoint configuration to do the mapping. So this gives you a lot more flexibility than Spring MVC with your actual URLs. Come on, IntelliJ, you can do it. It's thinking. We'll give it like one, two, three, and then we'll kill it and try again. Not responding. Okay. Usually works great. I've also noticed every once in a while, like when I'm typing in the terminal, the keyboard will stop working. The mouse still works, but um, rebooting IntelliJ usually solves that problem as well. So let's see if it went ahead and created that class for us. Yep, profile endpoint configuration. But it's got a dot .java ending, so I'm going to go ahead and delete it because it probably doesn't think it's an actual class. And we'll create it again. Profile endpoint configuration. And so if you notice this, it's using the routing from the router function in Spring Webflex. So it's able to say, hey, you know, for this predicate, which is I right here. Um, make sure it's insensitive. So if someone, you know, sends in like profiles, it's not going to care. And so that will go to the all handler of the profile handler. And then obviously get goes to get by ID, delete goes to delete by ID, and all that. And then we do need to create a case insensitive request predicate. So we'll go ahead and do that. Of a class case insensitive request predicate. So this is just, you know, lower casing. It's doing a test, lower casing the URI server request wrapper and making all that work. So we won't have a problem if anyone actually uses, you know, different URLs than we have. So we've created all that. We got that predicate. And now we can restart it and confirm everything works. So I'll use the uh, configuration of IntelliJ this time instead of running it from the command line. As soon as it finishes processing. This is an important thing about Lombok, is if you don't enable annotation processing in your IDE, whether that's any of the ones I mentioned, then um, some things won't compile. So make sure and enable that. And then edit the configuration to specify the spring profile to use. So we want to use that demo one so we have some data in there. So that's what I'm doing there. Active profiles, hit OK, and then run it. And at this point, we should be able to hit the profiles endpoint. Oh, it doesn't like that. Let's try creating it again. Profile endpoint configuration profile handler is empty. So IntelliJ must have lost that. Okay. Back to our handler configuration, and that's all compiling. Okay, try again. You notice I'm using Java 13, so this all works with the latest versions of Java. And now, if I were to go to the profiles endpoint, should render in my browser. Right, and it does, and of course, if we were to hit it here, it works there as well.
And we're using the WebFlex handler, right, instead of the uh, traditional REST controller now. So now I'll create a web sockets UI, basically. So under resources, I'm going to create a static.ws HTML file. I'm just going to use web sockets here. And you'll see it's just a profile notification client. It basically uses the WebSocket API that's built into JavaScript, talks to that endpoint, and when a new message comes in, it's just going to send out an alert. So to make that new message, I'll create a shell script, and we'll call this create.sh. And you'll see it's just going to hit that endpoint and send a random email with a number on the end. So now if we go to our terminal here, we can make sure that's executable. And then if we have our browser window here, um, we do actually have to restart everything because uh, by default, Spring MVC or Spring WebFlex or even Spring MVC, Spring Boot, any static files won't be picked up right away unless you do a restart. Um, there is a way that you can configure an application that property, especially with TimeLeaf, to look for them without a restart, but often it's just easier to restart. So now we'll go to ws.html. So we have that there, and then we can create a new thing. Let's see what our message is here. Oh, it failed. Unrespected response code. So. Let's make sure our WebSocket configuration. Oh, that got lost too, huh? WebFlex WebSocket. Okay, so now restart. That that's in there. So that was probably because I killed IntelliJ and it hadn't saved all those files. So that shouldn't happen normally, but sometimes it does. Right, so then we refresh here, and that's connecting. And then if we were to send, you can see, you know, it's popping up with those messages. If we're going to do it again, it would pop up with a new one. So the next step is to enable service set events um, because this, this is just a cool feature, in my opinion. So we'll create a of a class, call it server sent event controller. And what this does is it's just a simple REST controller, but it listens for that same publisher. And when the events come in, it streams them out at this endpoint, SSE profiles. And you'll notice it has to be text event stream value as the media type. So then we can restart. And once it's restarted, Make sure that we can hit the endpoint first of all. So let's go to HTTP 8080 profiles. That's working. And then what we can do here is we can use HTTP and use dash S to stream. And so then if we create them, we'll actually see them there as you know streaming events. So that's all working. That's what I want to do for the most part on the server side. So we'll just leave that running, and I'll exit out of here. And then we'll create the reactive side, right? We have, or the React side. We have WebFlux there. I'm going to use MPX create React app. MPX is a command that came in, I think, NPM5 that allows you to not only do an NPM install, but actually execute the CLI command as well. So we're just going to call it React app, and we'll do template TypeScript. So this will take a minute or two to run. It kind of depends on your internet connection and you know how much you have going on there because what it's really doing is it's NPM installing all these dependencies. And JavaScript doesn't really have binary dependencies like we do in Java. So this is actually probably installing you know 500,000 lines of code in my node modules directory. Um, but you know that's how things work. And it's funny because you know we used to complain about Maven like downloading the internet. And I think NPM like downloads the internet, invites all its friends. So you know, there's a there's a lot that goes on. You can see all those dependencies and transitive dependencies there, 
and it initializes as a Git repository because it detects that I have Git installed, and then uh, it makes everything work that way. So once that's done, what I can run is npm start. Um, you could also use Yarn. Yarn and npm are very similar. They're just you know package managers that run commands. Um, you'll notice it's using Yarn in this one, but I tend to use npm because they're pretty much the same these days. So you can use npm start, and it'll start a new application. Now oh, you got to be in it, right? So it'll start a new application up on port 3000. And it's doing a little TypeScript compiling. That's why it takes a bit to start the development server. If you're just using regular old JavaScript, it might be a little faster. So that's it, right? It's just got that spinning logo there. And now what we can do is we can add some logic into the project itself. So I'm just going to open up IntelliJ in the parent directory. So I'm going to close this one, but we'll stop Java first. And then we'll open it here. So here, idea. And then we'll have both projects. So if we need to switch back and forth between them, it shouldn't be too hard. So in the React app, there's an app.tsx. So you'll see it's just a function by default. So I'm going to change it to use class-based stuff because that's my preference. Uh, most React developers are a little different. So class app uh, extends component. And then we'll take this return right here and we'll put that into a render method. And the reason I'm not getting any help yet is there's still some indexing going on here. So it's not you know, importing that component, but um, it should shortly. So now let's try to import it. Uh, the show context action is not available. So uh, IntelliJ is usually great, right? I mean, most of the time you're not waiting for indexing to happen, but it does happen from time to time in demos. So now we're extending that component, and I'm going to add a component did mount method. We're going to hit that profiles endpoint. And we're just going to use fetch, right? This is the new XHR. It's going to hit that endpoint. It's going to grab the response in JSON and then set it to a local profiles state. So I'm going to create a few interfaces, create a profile interface. And this is just going to have our ID, which is a number, and then an email, which is a string. And then we'll also create an app props for the properties that are coming into the component. So that's interface props. That's just going to be empty for now. And then interface app state. So this is going to have is loading, right? Because we're setting that down in that uh, component did mount. Is loading is just a Boolean. And profiles is an array profile. Okay, and so once you have those set up, you can pass those into your component. So app props and app state. So the state is basically the data in your component, and then the props are what's passed into it. And we'll create a constructor and set those profiles to be empty in the beginning, and then is loading to be false. All right, and so now that we have that up and running, we can uh, we can modify what's rendered down here. So we'll take out the edit and the learn react, and we'll go ahead and uh, do a list of the profiles. So we'll take those profiles, map them out. But again, that kind of messed up there. Oh, I want max program size, but oh well. So then we have profile, and then it's a type of profile, and the profile right here. I know why that didn't work. It's because I didn't have my uh, my 
if nothing's there, then don't show it. So that's a loading logic. So profiles is loading, and we grab that from the state. And if it's still loading, it just returns that. So profiles like that. And now everything will compile. So we have this profile list here, and we're just looping through those and showing them. And so one thing React does require is this key to identify different unique elements. So that's why I put the ID in there. So we'll scroll a bit up here, see where we are. Um, now the next thing we need to do is because we're hitting localhost 3000, that's actually not the Spring Boot endpoint, right? That's the React endpoint. Um, we're going to proxy everything to the Spring Boot just for now because that makes it easier and we don't have to deal with cores. So down in your package.json file, you can just add a proxy and specify your endpoint. So React knows what all its routes are. So any routes that aren't in it, it'll go ahead and proxy. So now we can start our Spring Boot app. So if we go to Webflex here, we can hit on the palm.xml and add that as a Maven project. And that'll allow us to run it again from the IDE. So we'll go into that demo. And we'll go into demo application. And then we do have to set up an SDK. Lots of Ruby ones. We'll use 11.04. And wait a bit for that to kick in. I can go back and see if there's any questions while we wait for that. Hmm. There's a chat. Let's see if there's anything in there. So Q&A. May I ask what you use Hammerspoon for? So that's, uh, that's Hammerspoon right here. That's how I do the things on the left. Right and uh, and move things around. So that's how I'm using Hammerspoon. I have a script in there that says, "Hey, you know, for all these different coordinates, um, use these hotkeys and put them in different places." So that's all running now, and we can uh, we can go on this demo application and run it. But as soon as it creates it, we're going to want to stop it because we need to edit that configuration to add the demo profile. So it's going to pop up after it compiles everything and say, here, we're running it, but I'll stop it. And then we'll run it again. And now if we do npm start, the terminal here, cd into react. And we should be able to connect to that back end. Right, and so that's all working. We're pulling in those profiles, so that's good. We have the, the basics in place. Um, the one cool thing about React is the first time I tried to, you know, create a component, I found it was it was very easy. So um, I just want to show you it's it's very intuitive. I could create a profile list from what we have in app.tsx and really isolate the logic that we have for this class. So instead of app, I'm going to call it profile, profile list, and we'll replace the name there, the name there, the name there. All right, rename those. And then as far as all this stuff down here, we don't really need it, right, because that'll be in the app itself. So we can kind of get rid of that, rename this profile list, and then we have kind of a self-contained component. So we can release or remove any imports that we aren't using and reformat, and we're not using app.css either. And so now everything's in its own you know, little spot, and we could go back to app.tsx and take it back to what it was, and then just use that component. So instead of having this here, do profile list. And now back here, everything still works, right? If we refresh it, 
we're still pulling it in. So I really like that feature of React that it's very easy to extract components from existing components, similar to Java in that way. I remember when I worked with GWT, it was easy to say, okay, this can be extracted out and you could use your ID to do that. So now what I wanna do is show you the different ways of streaming data, right? So I'm gonna modify this profile list component to first of all, just use a interval, one of the bare bones ways of doing it. So we're gonna basically fetch the data, set the late loading state to true, go grab those profiles, and then we'll also have this interval that executes every second and calls that fetch data method again. So we need to add an interval variable here. So type any, and then that will all be working. And so the next thing is to create a stream uh, creator. So we'll go ahead and create a create stream.sh. And how this works is it'll go up to, you know, 120 and it'll just keep adding profiles using that similar, you know, random one, random two, random three. And so back here, if we were to create that stream, so go into Webflux, make that executable. You can see there's a little bit of flickering. And if we start to create the stream, those will show up and, uh, and it's kind of janky. At, at one point, um, you see it now, every once in a while the screen kind of flashes. And part of the problem here is we're we're actually refetching all of the data, right? We're not just fetching the new ones that are coming through, we're refetching all of them. So that's not you know, a great way, but um, there was a little bit of screen flickering. It used to be much worse when I would do this demo, maybe it's just the live feed, um, but I wanna make it even better. So one of the ways to do that is using RxJS. So instead of using just those primitives, you can use RxJS. So I'll go into this React app and npm I R X J S, or maybe I'll use yarn since that's what it did for everything else. So Rx JS allows you to do is similar to that polling that we had, but using their classes. So in profile list, I'll change this code here. Using RxJS, you see here it kicks off a request that says, hey, start with zero. So as soon as you know you hit this logic, go ahead and make a fetch to this endpoint. And then when you get the results, you know, replace all of the profiles. So again, we're doing something very similar to uh, you know, interval, but a bit different. So we'll remove that variable and we'll see if RxJS is installed back here. It looks like it is. And so now we should get the imports for these. Close that one up there. Oh, IntelliJ is not grabbing the import. So we can just manually put them in. So import, Let's see, what was it? It was uh, start with and switch map and interval. And then the switch map, start with and switch map are both in the operators. Okay, so now we can run that one. Awkward pause. Come on, React. Oh, it didn't like the back end being down. Is it down? No, it still looks like it's up. But we get, did get some proxy errors there. Well, let's see what happens if we create new data. 
So it's adding them, right? We didn't clear out our old data, so now we're getting one, two, three. It's a bit smoother, but like I said, we didn't see the jankiness with interval that I am used to, so maybe something changed there in recent versions of React. I'm also going to restart my server so we don't have so many for the next demo. So the next one I'm going to show is with WebSockets, and WebSockets give us the ability to basically only get the new data that's coming in. It is much more efficient. So we do have to originally fetch all the data, right? But then our WebSocket is just going to listen for any new messages coming in, and then it just adds it to the existing profile. So instead of refetching all the profiles each time, which is inefficient, we're just going to grab the latest ones. So then we can remove these imports up here. And we do have to create a, another type of proxy. So set up proxy.js. You do have to name the file that. And then it'll be a React proxy shortcut. And we're just using the HTTP proxy middleware. And we're going to allow it to proxy WebSockets. Because by default, the proxy in that package.json doesn't support WebSockets. So now if we restarted, or we shouldn't need, oh, we do need to restart because we modified and created that file. And it won't pick that up by default on startup. So now we have that regular list. And if we're going to do that create stream, you can see that works. And it's just getting those new ones that are added instead of refetching the whole list. So much more efficient. The last thing I wanted to show you is how to do it with event source. So in profile list, we'll change this from using WebSockets to using an event source. Right, that server-side event handler that we created, that controller. So it, again, is going to hit profiles. And then this event source is built into JavaScript. So it's going to establish a new event source to that service event handler on the server side. And I found this on open is very important because when I was first trying to make all this work, I was getting this console open, but nothing else. And so I knew the event source and the endpoint was working. It turns out the problem was that the proxies that I set up, both for you know just HTTP and for WebSockets, don't work with service and events. So we actually have to make a direct request to Spring Boot. And to make that work on the Spring Boot side, we have to modify this service and event to have cross-origin annotation. So it allows you to connect from you know a different client. And if you want to you know really lock it down. You could do localhost 3000, right? Only from that origin. So then we'll restart the server. Our profile list should be recompiled here. So as soon as that server starts up, if we were to do this, it's just going to be loading. All right, and then refresh. So it's got those service and events. And then if we were to, you know, send some new ones, those will show up as well. So everything's working as far as you know, streaming data from the server and grabbing it on the client. The next thing or last thing I wanted to show you is how to add Okta for authentication. And it's not really Okta so much as just using OAuth. So a lot of this leverages Spring Security more so than anything. And so in the Webflux application, there's there's many ways to do this. So if we were to go to its palm.xml, you can add dependencies. So um, there's some that I have stored here. If you just want raw Spring MVC or Spring Security, these are all the dependencies for that. So the starter from security, the OAuth2 client, the OAuth2 resource server, we're going to use both of those in this demo, and then Jose um, for doing JWT handling. There's also an Okta Spring Boot starter that basically consolidates all those dependencies down to one. So the latest version of that is 1.4.0, um, but I'm not going to show that. Uh, the thing I did want to show is if you're using Spring Security, there's different properties that you configure. So in application.properties, actually, I believe I'm expecting a YAML. So let's rename this to YAML because I like pain. And if I were to use Spring Security, this is what it would look like. So it's got a whole bunch of you know 
nested properties if you were to use properties it'd be actually simpler but we have an issue or uri we have a client id and a client secret and scopes and then for setting up the resource server you need the issue or uri again well if you use the okta plugin which isn't really okta specific it just you know uses spring security and has some okta conditionals in there so um if we were to use okta oauth 2 yaml you can see much simpler, less properties, and it has all that same configuration. But what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna use either of those because there's this cool Maven plugin we developed that you can actually configure everything. So if you're brand new to Okta and you don't have an account, um, you can run com.okta, Okta Maven plugin, setup. And it'll prompt you for some values like what's your name, what's your email, and then how to create an app for you. Well, since I've already set things up, it's got all that done for me. So now if I go to my application, you'll see it even put that client ID, client secret and issuer in there. And if I were to go to palm.xml down at the bottom here, it added that Spring Boot Starter for me. So pretty handy you know, tool there. So I like to use that and then I'll restart everything. Hopefully it picked up that auto import before it restarted because if you didn't auto import and you're running it through the ID, then it doesn't know that you added that new dependency. And so we'll see here. If we go to 8080 profiles now, it'll redirect us, right, to log in with Okta. Or no, it didn't because it didn't pick up that import yet. So start it again. And so this is handy because, you know, on your Spring Boot side, you're protected. And if people hit the endpoint, which you wouldn't expect them to do in their browser, then they would get, you know, a, uh, a 401 normally. But in this case, what it configures by default is OAuth 2 login. So it redirects them to login instead of giving them, you know, a 401. So you can configure it either way. But now if we refresh, It'll still do that. So that's probably because I'm already logged in. So let's try an incognito window. Now it does prompt me to sign in. And now it pulls back everything, right? So we have the server side working. Now what do we need to do on the client side? So on the client side, there's a cool thing that I developed called OctaDev Schematics to add Okta basically to any or most client-side frameworks. So um, we're gonna need to first create a new um, app for Okta. So um, if I were to go here and go to my org, which is dev13320, I have to create a spa app for React. So if we were to look at the applications here, the Spring Boot one, it reads from your Maven information. So that's right here. It's got that demo name. And uh, I actually added some login redirect URIs. If it, if it detects that there's an app with the same name, it won't actually create a new one. So I'm gonna create a new SPA React application. And normally you could reuse the Spring Boot application, but for SPAs, we have Pixie, which is proof key for code exchange which is a much more robust authentication mechanism for spas. So I'm just gonna call this React app. And then you do wanna change all the ports because the first time you create an app, it'll create trusted origins for you with these ports. And if you go back and edit them later, it won't. So, and we're using authorization code, right? Not implicit. And then click done. And that'll give us a client ID that we can use right, which is right here. But we're gonna need an issuer first. So if we go to authorization servers, we can grab our issuer right here. And then if we go back to our instructions, we'll npm install Okta dev schematics. And you might be wondering why I didn't npm install dash D to put it in a developer dependency. Well, React has a theory that basically there are no developer dependencies. Everything is main dependency. And once you produce your final artifact, you know, there's things that are in there and there's things that are not. So um, I think it's a worthwhile thing, but you could put dash D and put it in your developer dependencies and it wouldn't be a big deal. 
So once that's done running, we can run schematics, dev schematics, make sure I spell everything right, and add auth. So still running that, installing it. I probably should have used yarn instead since this is the first time I used NPM, but we'll see if it works. And I did practice this demo beforehand and found that uh, the latest version did not work. So I did a release right before this. Let's hope we get that release or uh, this demo could take a little bit longer than expected. But come on, NPM, you can do it. I realize I'm at an hour, so hopefully this is only like five more minutes, and then we'll be done. Should have used yarn. Darn it. Let's see if there's any questions in the meantime. It's easy and fast inserting all these prepared code snippets, but how much work has it been to write this in the beginning? That's so complex and dense code. Right, Josh did all the hard stuff. I just did the React stuff. So the React side wasn't too bad, but I've seen Josh actually do, you know, compiling and creating all of the code in the backside from hand um, in like 45 minutes. So he's pretty good at that. I'll come back to the questions here. Oh, that's still going. So debugging reactive code can be hard. Can you tell us how you're doing debugging of your reactive code? So there's, uh, what's it called, Blockhound? Blockhound is one of the recommended ways. So it's reactor debugging. So it allows you to basically um, use it and debug like you normally would. Um, so that's what I haven't used it personally, but that's uh, that's what's recommended for the most part from the spring team. So we answered that one. Okay, and then what's the advantage of the handler approach compared to the annotated REST controller? Um, personally, I'm a fan of the REST controller because I'm familiar with Spring MVC. The handler gives you much more flexibility in the sense of you can map all the URLs out and do like the case insensitive stuff, which you can't normally do with Spring MVC. How many webinars have I done as a speaker? I've done a lot. Yeah, probably, uh, I mean, I've been a speaker for uh, 2004, 16 years, so yeah, done a lot. Why are you taking so long, NPM? Let's see, last one. Can you give us some examples for using reactive code? Well, if you're streaming data, right? So if you're Twitter and you have all these streams coming in, then uh, then that's probably a great idea. We did recently add in Hipster the ability to do reactive uh, microservices and monoliths, and even generate CRUD. I was kind of against the CRUD generation, but because you shouldn't be developing a CRUD app, but maybe you have most of it streaming and you need some small CRUD in there. So um, yeah, streaming apps are usually the best idea. You could do it with CRUD, but it's really not gonna give you a whole lot of advantages over regular Spring MVC. Okay, so that finally worked. And now we can run this add auth here. I'll close that one out. So it didn't like what I ran. Oh, this is because I probably used uh, yarn. So let's do just yarn again. That's the problem with, I've seen that when mixing NPM install yarn add. Doesn't always work. So I'm going to just wait for that to go again. Check for any new questions. Nope. So yeah, I mean, running npm install or yarn add during any sort of demo is usually um, can be very bad. In fact, the first time I ever did this talk was at Spring One, uh, 2018, and uh, and create React app was broke. And when I went to create the TypeScript version of my React app, that failed. And so I could never actually show a, a running UI. And it's crazy because that code is out there and that video is out there on like InfoQ and it still gets lots of views, but no one ever actually saw the UI running. I just showed them all the code and how it was supposed to work. So um, yeah, sorry about this. I didn't mean to run npm install, should have used yarn add. But I'm pretty confident that after doing this, it'll all work. 
or if I had fiber, like if I had fiber, I just moved to this house I'm in right now three years ago. And, uh, and we had fiber at our old house, but we got it like six months before we moved. And man, if you have fiber, you know, a gig connection, that's pretty darn nice. So come on, react, do your work or yarn. You're so close. Only 73,000 dependencies files. And it's got to build some fresh packages. Man, this is painful. All right, there we go. Now let's try it again. If this doesn't work, then I messed up something in the release, and we'll just move on. So it wants our issuer URL, which I copied, right? And then the OIDC apps client ID. So I had that in this here. And if we go back to our React app, then we can grab the client ID there. And so what this does is add our Okta React SDK, React Router DOM, and the types for React Router DOM, and then it creates a couple files, and it sets up, um, you know, tests. So it updates the tests so those will work with, uh, with Okta, as well as it modifies that app.tsx. So we should be able to go into that app.tsx and see what changed. Um, it's not quite ready yet. Or maybe IntelliJ just hasn't caught up. Oh, there we go. So it's got a configuration here that specifies that issuer and that client ID. So if some reason you fat fingered it or pasted wrong, you could just go into this file and change it. That's the only place they are. It sets up this security component that makes it so you have to log in to get to you know any particular area. And then this login callback that handles setting your access tokens and ID tokens when those come back. It also creates a home.tsx. And so you can see here, this has an auth service and an auth state, which you can talk to. There's this with Okta auth higher order component, and it's got login and log out methods, and then there's buttons. So our profile list, you know, was back here, and we do need to make some modifications. So this profile list will put right in here, and we'll path, pass the auth state to it. So the props auth state that we have from this main home component that we're going to use to log in. And then down here at the bottom, we can take those edit links out. But it's just going to have the body, which is either going to be a login button or it's going to be a log out button with whatever component you specify there. So now we need to import the profile list. Or we'll wait for IntelliJ to catch up. Again. Maybe. Come on, import it. All right. There we go. So now we should be able to start our client. Well, I wanted to make the buttons more visible. Oh, we're still doing that stuff, huh? Great. Um, let's modify the app.css just to make our buttons a bit bigger. We're just going to give some margin to them and make them bigger. And hopefully this will finish pretty soon. I did an NPM install. So if this doesn't work, then, hey, it worked earlier. I know it works if you actually went through the tutorial. And there's actually a, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash c slash octadev. I do have this full demo out there. It's probably a year old, so it's not using Spring 2.2, um, but otherwise it should work. So. Yarn started up. And we can close this one here. So it's still waiting. And so we're going to have to make some changes after this loads because one thing is logging in, but the other thing is talking to our server to get that data and so we'll need to pass to that server an access token and we'll be able to get that from the Okta React SDK on the front end but we still need to pass it to the back end. Oh so it's warning us about the profile list we haven't specified that auth state as a prop that's coming in so auth state is any 
and that should cause things to reload and now it's working and you'll notice it's it's actually talking to the back end so oops it's uh it's kind of weird that that worked uh that's because it's proxying right to the back end so um it doesn't require anything so let's modify this profile list to pass in an access token so i'm going to go here And so we're going to use just component bid mount as a sample, and we'll go to that profiles endpoint, and we'll pass an authorization header with that bearer token, and then get the access token from the auth state. And you'll notice now we're getting a cores error. Well, we need to do some work on the Spring side of things, so we'll just create a Spring security or Spring configuration security configuration class. So this, what this does is it configures things a bit more because currently WebFlex doesn't support um, securing WebSockets. This is why I left the WebSockets wide open, you know, permit all. And then OAuth2 login and resource server, those are all the defaults. So this is just customizing that. If you were to run Spring Boot and React on the same server, then you would need to do something like this to make your CSRF tokens available to the React client so it could read it from a cookie and send it back or read it from, yeah, read it from a cookie and then send it back to the server in a header. But since these are on different ports, that really doesn't matter. And then this is setting up the cores configuration. So this error goes away right here. So I'll restart after adding that. And then while we're waiting for that, we can create a new um, stream or we'll update our create stream to use authentication because now what we're gonna wanna pass in is that authorization header to actually create those records. So this should be working now, right? Come on, there we go. So that's working. And if we were to look back at our profile list, we lost all of that stuff we were doing before so let's change this to use WebSockets again. So now what it's doing is again, it's going to fetch all the profiles in the beginning, but because we actually you know, can't secure WebSockets, what we need to do is, uh, is first of all, we're just gonna grab the ID of, from the WebSocket of the profile, and then we'll go ahead and fetch it from the server. So it's a little chatty, but that's because you know, we don't want to pass the whole profile in case there's sensitive information in there. We want to make sure that's locked down. So the idea I don't think is that sensitive. Um, we do have to change our web socket configuration. So it only sends back an ID though. So we'll take this source out of here and we'll just pass a map back to it. So we'll call that data and we'll take the profile here and we'll cast it to profile and then we'll create that map of string string and we'll put the ID in there and data dot put okay and that will just give us that ID on the front end so now we can restart this and then all the logic in our profile list should work where it grabs all the profiles initially it grabs you know any new ones that are being sent and it goes ahead and fetches and adds them to the list here. So to have that create stream work with authentication, you can use open IDC debugger or OIDC debugger. So I have an endpoint configured here, right? For the authorize endpoint, the redirect URI is this, and I'll just put a state of one, two, three, and I need a token back. So I can hit send request. It gives me that access token back and I can go to my script, create stream and paste it right here. All right, so now if we go back to our app, that should be working, All right? It's talking to the server. It's getting those profiles. And if we were to add any new ones, down here.
and it should add those as well. So it's posting them in a secure way, and we're communicating. We're using WebSockets. So WebSockets aren't secure, but that's a limitation of uh, WebFlex and WebSockets. So um, that is the majority of the demo. Sorry, it took so long, so I'll just fly through the rest of these slides here. Um, ES6, ES7, and TypeScript. Um, you can use TypeScript and get a lot of the beauties of ES6. ES6 is what gave us, you know, actual class objects. So you can see here's an example of a bus because I like Volkswagen buses. And a lot of what's going on here is actually ES6, not so much TypeScript. In fact, if using TypeScript, that constructor there, right, it's using TypeScript because it has the string parameters or the string types. But with TypeScript, you don't need to set that local variable. Um, as long as you have it in the constructor argument, it'll set it and create it for you with that same name. The getters and setters are a little bit different in ES6, JavaScript, and TypeScript. Um, you see the get and set. Um, it's not like get name and set name like we have in Java. And then down at the bottom there, there's a string interpolation so you can inline variables and stuff. You'll need Node. Hello World with React, pretty easy. And when React first came out, it was very controversial because people were putting HTML, right, in their JavaScript. And so now, you know, five, six years later, no one seems to mind. And one of the biggest differences with imperative code like jQuery is a lot of times there's so much conditional logic for all the different states. With React, it's actually much less and a little bit easier to read. So this logic here is saying, hey, I don't, actually, I didn't know this until I started, you know, writing this presentation was that is if you get more than 99 notifications on Facebook, it like turns into flames and, you know, lights up, has fire. So uh, so if the count is more than 99, then it adds fire and there's all this logic. If it already has fire, then remove it. And then if the count is zero, then remove the badge and all that. And so with React, um, it's a bit different. And that second else if really is the important part of this because what will happen is that count will probably be zero in the beginning. So it'll just render that class name of Bell. And then when it comes back and there's actually a count, it doesn't need to process that first div again. All it adds is that middle span. So it's really doing a virtual DOM diff, and that's what makes React so fast, unlike you know having to re-render everything. And so create React app is a great way to do that. I hope you're hearing my cat in the background. She wants something. Um, learning React, this is a great video for it. Eric Vicente basically walks you through creating an app and using a GitHub repository that he created to do it. It's a couple years old, but everything's still very relevant. Um, to handle the streaming data, like I showed you, there's several different options. Our socket, I did not show you today, um, but that is certainly an option and Spring Security does have uh, authentication support for that. So I should look into using that. I showed you this demo of creating a React client. JHipster has React support and now WebFlex support. So. Um, it's not released yet as far as the generator of the entities, but uh, Gateway, Spring Cloud Gateway is in there, and the microservices are in there. I wrote a book on JHipster. It doesn't cover React or WebFlux, though, so you're probably not interested. So the action is to try Spring WebFlux, try React, try OpenID Connect, explore progressive web apps, which I never talked about. I just think it's a good idea if you're developing web apps to try to make them so they work on mobile devices better and faster and then enjoy the experience. So again, you could do it all yourself from the blog post. And uh, I also wrote another post on doing CRUD, just simple CRUD with React and Spring Boot. It's one of my most popular posts. It's, I think, up to, uh, yeah, it's got a lot of comments. Um, so you can learn all of them, you know, with this series going through there. And uh, we post a lot of interesting topics on our blog, the developer blog on Okta. And uh, you can follow my team at OctaDev. So the source for everything you've seen today is at that URL. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to hit up myself or even Josh for the WebFlux stuff. And I will upload this presentation later today once we're finished. And may the auth be with you. So now I'll go and check for any more questions here. So, so looks like there's no there more aren't questions. any questions anymore on that. Um, so this time was the second time you're running a webinar with us. So I'm really happy that it went so smooth. And I have a question yeah. regarding your Volkswagen bus, actually. 
So your Volkswagen bus is all over the place, like uh, in your presentation several times and so on. But actually, how much time do you spend in the Volkswagen bus? Well, here's a picture of them. So I have two of them. There's uh, there's not only the old, you know, 66 one, but there's also this 1990 Vanagon on the left there. That is a synchro, so it's four-wheel drive. And so that one tends to be more of my winter vehicle because, you know, it's four-wheel drive and it snows around here a fair amount. And, you know, you can pop the top and sleep upstairs. Um, the other one is more of a summer vehicle, but really it gets hot here in the summer. So it's more of a spring and fall because, you know, air conditioning is nice in the summer and the yellow one doesn't have air conditioning. So I drive in the spring and fall a lot, but I've even driven it this week. So it's been nice and warm here. That's great. Um, another question I had regarding the wet plug stuff. So Oracle is still saying you have to wait until Project Loom um, fibers, and they, now they are calling it lightweight threads. What do you think about that? Will that like um, have an impact on on the React stack? How we have it now, like from all the way down from the React JavaScript to to wet flux, or what do you think about that? Well, so I think Project Loom is very interesting because they do give you the ability to do lightweight threads. And uh, what I see happening there is it will probably make it so a lot of the React folks or the Reactive projects can just delete code, right? Because it's it's used by, you know, they can leverage Project Loom there. The problem is Project Loom is going to come with like, I don't know, Java 16 or something like that. And they're still going to have all these people that aren't willing to use the latest and greatest JDK. So... I would think that over time, you know, there's less to maintain for the project, like Project Reactor and, you know, Java RX and all that. But at the same time, like, are they willing to say, like, you have to use Java 16, right? Because that might eliminate a fair amount of users. So I do like the idea, and hopefully there'll be some maybe new frameworks. But, you know, for the most part, as end developers and users of the frameworks, like, we're probably still going to write the same amount of code, right? but a lot of the complexity is really underlying in the, the projects we're using. So will that change or something in the front end? No, the front end, uh, I think, you know, even our socket is probably one of the most interesting things to happen in the back end because it's a new like protocol, just like HTTP and it's got like back pressure built in and all that. And a lot of the R socket demos I've seen are pretty nice when you're using Java all the way down. Like you have a Java FX client mm -hmm. and a back end server with, you know, R socket. But as soon as you get to the web, like all you got is web sockets, right? And even there's an R socket project for the web, but it leverages web sockets, right? And so there's not really much new there on the web side of things that you know allows us to do this streaming data in a secure way. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So it seems like there are not more questions coming up. Do you want to share something else or? No, no. The only thing I would say is if you do have, you know, more questions and just hit me up on, on Twitter, you know, at mrable, M-R-A-I-B-L-E. My direct messages are wide open. I'm happy to answer questions there. Or send me an email at matt.rabel at octa.com and I'll try to help. So great. Thank you very much for being our first presenter, actually, in your online channel. And also like the, sp uh, the time you spend with us setting up all the things and trying things out. And as I heard from my colleagues, actually, things went way smoother than yesterday. So I'm really, really happy about that. Except probably sometimes um, the, the, the audio was not that great when you did like um, this yarn install. But beside that, actually, it was really great. And, and, and also like the tooling you used was really nice to see that um, you can do a lot of things with these code snippets and um, also like uh, the, the scripts and also Maven plugin to use. That was actually really great. Thank you very much for for being with us um, on the first, um, yeah, or the first and the second um, webinar we did. And obviously, um, you will get, as all our presenters, the, the Java user group um, Swiss Army knife. But we have to send it to the US because nobody of us can come to the US and give it to you personally. Or right. maybe we'll see each other. Someone soon again in Europe or in Switzerland it would be great to having you yeah. again. I'd love to visit. I'm I'm sad I didn't 
couldn't be there in person, but obviously different times. We'll see. Uh, actually, anyway, you have to do like the, the ski trip um, in Switzerland, going to San Martin, doing things there. That's something. Right, it's not the ski in the Alps, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Um, All right. Thank you. Very much. Also, thank you to our um, um, sponsors we had. Um, as always, like which are helping us to actually organize all the events. And I also would love to thank you our um, our stuff in the background. So actually, Marcus, which was setting up all his on, uh, online conferencing tool, and Thomas also yesterday um, doing the first run with you. And then obviously also Ursula, which is also doing the coordination, sending out emails to all the participants and so on. So that's actually great. Yes. Don't forget actually to give us feedback because when we end the webinar, you will see immediately, or when you get out of the webinar, you will see immediately the feedback form. Please use this. We would love to have your feedback. That would actually be great so we can improve also with this new format. And yeah, let's see each other soon again, hopefully also in person. Great. So thank you very much for being with us, Matt. And thank yeah. you the ones who are looking this presentation, that's actually great. Thank you very much. Bye.